lockdown, cancel culture, Megxit, we're cursed to live in interesting times. Thankfully, Spiked is here to help you make sense of it all and to push back against the tide of misanthropy, authoritarianism and identity politics. But to do that, we need your help. We rely on donations from readers and listeners like yourself to keep our content free and available to all. One-off donations are hugely appreciated, but monthly donations are even better. They allow us to plan for the future and to grow. Even £5 per month is a huge help. So, start donating today by going to spikes-online.com and clicking the red donate button in the top right corner. That's spikes-online.com and the red donate button. Now, onto the Spiked Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Spiked Podcast. I'm Fraser Myers and joining me this week, as ever, we have Spiked's deputy editor, Tom Slater. Hello. And Spiked columnist, Ella Whelan. Hi. Coming up on the show, a year of lockdown the Boulder and Atlanta shootings, and the EU vaccine crisis. I must give the British people a very simple instruction. You must stay at home. We're only keeping measures where they are necessary, and then we can do away with this act for good. Boris Johnson has warned that the third wave of coronavirus sweeping through Europe is likely to wash up on our shores as well. The basic concept of vaccine certification should not be totally alien to us. This week... The UK marked an unhappy anniversary. It's been a year since the government enacted its first lockdown. A year since Boris Johnson told the whole nation to stay at home. It was supposed to last for three weeks to flatten the curve to stop the NHS from being overwhelmed. Then the PM said we'd need 12 weeks to send coronavirus packing. England has been in full lockdown for 195 days. That's 53% of the past year. At times, including just recently in January, Britons have been living under some of the strictest conditions in the world. The lockdown represents one of the most extreme curtailments of liberty ever experienced in liberal democratic societies. It has upended everyday life and the economy, touching every section of society. And we're still very much in the thick of it. Over 120,000 people have died with the virus. The vaccines have offered hope, but even despite an extraordinary rollout, the coronavirus restrictions will be with us for at least another three months. Tom, what are your thoughts? It was a very grim milestone, as you say, because we're now a year into what is an unprecedented experiment in authoritarianism. And there are some people who will say, and there'll be arguments for years to come about whether or not this was on balance worth it. But I think the point that really needs to be drawn out is that this isn't a question about saying we should have done nothing versus locking down in this way. This isn't necessarily even a question about whether or not in one way, shape or form, we did need restrictions on liberty in order to deal with a unique crisis. There's the question of the scale, but also there's the question of the way in which it was done, the way in which this has normalised these kinds Mm. of measures and the paucity of any challenge to it, which I think makes it incredibly likely, and we're already seeing signs of this, that some version of this sort of biosecurity state which has been assembled will continue on after this pandemic. I mean, the way in which the lockdown was ushered in, we have to cast our minds back. This was in a moment of enormous panic in which you had the government usher in, as you say, unprecedented restrictions on our civil liberties with zero parliamentary scrutiny. For much of the past year, the lockdown has been governed by public health regulations, brought in through the Public Health Act 1984, very few safeguards, basically just Matt Hancock ruling by decree. Mm. There's been so little opposition even challenging Parliament. And what I think we've seen there, that's not any scary on its own terms, but we've got a bit of a crash course in what happens when you have kind of supreme power with precious little accountability. You know, we've seen nonsensical restrictions sail onto the statute book and sit there for for months on end if you think about the the curfews which led to people bunching in trains at 10pm each night or whatever. Also, we've seen what happens when you hand the state and the police, not just the power, but the moral authority to clamp down on people with no regard for their rights whatsoever. We've talked about some of the examples this week, you know, breaking up a terminally ill child's birthday party or serving a homeless man with a charge for breaking the stay at home order. Like oh, These are just the kind of more absurd, but nevertheless sinister examples of what happens when you green like this kind of authoritarianism. And what we're talking about this week with the ban on leaving the country, which is it's been a principle of liberal democratic nations for a very long time that you should be allowed to leave if you mm. so wish. 
that's very, very concerning. And then, of course, the discussion which has exploded back into the centre over the past 24 hours or so around vaccine passports, which at this point looked like a foregone conclusion, frankly. We've gone from Boris Johnson suggesting that he was at best bristling at this idea to making clear that it's going to come through in one way, shape or form. So I think to all of those people who suggested that we were paranoid, that we weren't focusing on the main issue when we were talking about the threat to civil liberties at the height of this pandemic, I think they look pretty stupid now, frankly, because what we've seen is not only the huge toll this has taken on our fundamental freedoms, but also the fact that because there hasn't been that scepticism, because there hasn't been that pushback, it feels like these things are just going to formalise themselves for the long term and face very little opposition in that. And I think we've seen that with the the new, not just the continuation of the lockdown, but the new measures which have been introduced over the course of the past week or talked about. Ella? I think it's worth just mentioning some of the, just the data and how much for example, legislation has been passed. But the Civil Liberties campaign, Big Brother Watch, has released a report and it's just quite amazing. I mean, they detail the fact that according to Hansard, there's been a total of 379 coronavirus-related statutory instruments laid before Parliament since the beginning of 2020. 742 pieces of legislation have been passed which contain the word coronavirus. And there have been powers in 114 Acts of Parliament, five orders and five EU regulations, which have been used to lay coronavirus-related statutory instruments. So it's in terms of lawmaking in terms of the way in which, and in particular, as many have pointed out, the nature of the speed and lack of uh, democratic process in which many of these statutory instruments have come into place and laws have come into place is just staggering. And to anyone who thinks that we're in a different position now than we were in, say, March of last year or even October of last year, needs to think again because we're talking today on Thursday and Parliament is about to today usher in, essentially, they vote on, but essentially nod through mm. a further six months of coronavirus regulation, six months being many months past the 21st of June date when we were supposedly told that life would return to some form of normality. And so, you know, just on the very basics in terms of the sheer amount of law that's been passed, it's been a really, you know, quite remarkable and draconian year, but also in the kind of the tone of the way in which the government has dealt with restrictions and dealt with, in some cases, necessary restrictions throughout the pandemic has told you a lot about the way in which we value freedom because the whole way through, as Tom's mentioned, there's been the kind of poo-pooing of the idea that liberty, democracy, you know, things that we should and previously cherished as a liberal open society have been sidelined as almost non-existent or not important. And while that might have been understandable in the initial stages of the pandemic because of the newness of the situation and the sort of terror that many of us felt about this virus, a year on, the fact that we are still having that hesitancy around opening up, that the government is still posing, for example, the roadmap as dates in which nothing can happen before then, you know, using the phrase no earlier than, mm. rather than fronting it as a positive move saying that by this date we will open up it shows you that you know even after the 21st of june we've got a lot to work on in terms of building back that belief in freedom and actually that belief in being able to deal with risk and actually it's it's remarkable to think how much has changed simply in between now and the imposition of the third lockdown i think the third lockdown has really you know, ushered in a kind of shift where the precautionary principle rules more so than at any other point, because you could see that there was a kind of balancing to be had between keeping the economy open up, letting people meet up with each other, trying to kind of manage this process. Whereas now we're simply living through, you know, complete and utter precaution. We have our borders closed for the foreseeable future because of what scientists are talking about, a kind of potential vaccine resistant variant. We don't know that such a thing is going to come about, but that's the level of precaution. And it seems as if that even as we open up, we're being told, and even as people gain more protection from the vaccines, we're being told that every freedom comes with trade-offs. You know, so we will be able to open pubs, but only with a vaccine passport. We'll be able to open up Britain, but only at the expense of closed borders. So even as the threat of the actual disease kind of recedes, 
freedom is not being restored anytime soon. Mm. And, and it's being made very clear, very, very clear that, you know, what extra liberty which we might be given could be taken away at any moment and are, you know, totally conditional on whatever data the government decides. Mm. And it's interesting as well, because recently we've seen Chris Whitty quite explicitly kind of rule out zero COVID as an ambition or whatever. And that's obviously, I mean, it's impossible. And he's right to say that. But at the same time, what's interesting is that particularly with this vaccine passports idea, it's kind of implying the idea that there is no safe level of COVID regardless yeah. of how vaccinated the population is. Because fundamentally, if the most vulnerable people in society are vaccinated against this, and even at a higher degree, just a huge proportion of the population, what is the point of these things? Unless you are concerned about there being any spread of this disease whatsoever in any circumstance, and that needs to be tamped down on. And I think actually the vaccine passport things is interesting because of the way in which fundamental changes to our way of life, having to provide this app, this document, this QR code, even determining that you have been vaccinated or that you've recently had a negative test or whatever, is something which would fundamentally change our engagement with just society and the principle that particularly once you're within the country in which you live and have rights that you shouldn't be stopped and asked for your papers and yet this has been ushered in with no debate whatsoever yeah i mean boris johnson said a while ago that we need to open a discussion about this there's been no discussion about this whatsoever there's been a consultation which has been open which i think is closing just days before boris johnson intends to announce his plans for what this whole scheme might look like. The government have been incredibly evasive on this, effectively saying that they're not going to introduce them, but meanwhile saying that they're not going to get in the way, giving grants to companies which are working on the technology. And so what you have is this fundamental change to our way of life, moving us towards a kind of papers please society. And yet it's been done with no real debate, no real dissent, at least in mainstream politics, no real discussion. And it's a policy which is going to be incredibly coercive. There is some strength to the argument that it's basically mandatory vaccinations by stealth. It's trying yep. to coerce people into taking vaccinations, even in terms of businesses that might want to go a different way because you see some pub landlords, et cetera, saying we'll never do this. But some of the suggestions which are coming out of government at the moment are suggesting that pubs which do carry this scheme will be able to open up with no social distancing and pubs that don't would have to still maintain rule of six and table service and all this stuff. So even the coercion on the businesses' ability to decide for themselves, because that's one argument that's being made for it. People, you know, these businesses should be able to decide for themselves, etc. So it just shows you that the concern that we've talked about for a long time, which is this mode of making decisions and this mode of introducing authoritarian policies in this unchecked, almost automatic fashion, has kind of been normalised at this point. Yeah. And I think the vaccine passports is a perfect example of that. It seems like we're going to get them whether we want it or not. And after having barely minutes it feels like a proper discussion about its implications and given you know the stage that we are at with the pandemic with the vaccine rollout we do have to assume or at least be wary of the fact that anything that's introduced now will be with us for a long time there's a kind of understandable response to have said you know oh well a lockdown will only be x number of weeks at the height of the pandemic when we don't know anything about the disease when we don't know what level of immunity we have in society etc cetera, etc cetera. But presumably something as complicated as vaccine passports are not going to be, you know, thrown out after a month of experimentation. And the restrictions on, on borders as well, you know, raise these kinds of questions because then you're dependent on the vaccination progress of all these other countries. And so it's, it's hard to see that even, yes, as we will all be hopefully celebrating in May when they open up the pubs and in June when they get rid of the rest of the restrictions, you know, we really do have to keep our eye on, on some of this stuff because it, it could be here for the long term. Did you know that Netflix and a whole host of other streaming services have films and TV shows that are only available in certain countries? So whenever you get fed up with what you're being offered, you can use ExpressVPN to unlock movies and shows that are only available elsewhere. In recent weeks, I've used ExpressVPN to rewatch A Clockwork Orange on Netflix US and to access South Park Studios, where you can stream South Park episodes for free, but only in America. ExpressVPN can unblock all this content because it lets you change your online location without you having to move an inch. You can control where you want websites to think you're located. The tech sounds complicated, but it's actually incredibly easy to do. You just open up the ExpressVPN app, choose a location, tap one button to connect and refresh your browser and you can open a whole new internet. You can choose from almost a hundred different countries. It's 
basically letting you supercharge your Netflix subscription with way more content. Right now, you can watch The Dark Knight and Brooklyn Nine-Nine on Canada's Netflix. You can watch Rick and Morty on French Netflix or The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air on Australian Netflix. And this works with any streaming services, including ones you can't access from your country at all. So Americans can access BBC iPlayer. Anyone can start using Peacock, a free streaming service, just by changing your location to the US. So why choose ExpressVPN over similar kinds of services? First, you can stream in HD, no problem. It adds no buffering or lag to have it running in your background. It's compatible with all your devices, your phones, media consoles, smart TVs, and more. And not only does it let you change your location and open up all this fantastic content, it also encrypts your data and lets you surf the web safely and anonymously. Even better, if you go to expressvpn.com slash spiked, you can get an extra three months of ExpressVPN for free. That's expressvpn.com slash spiked. Ten people were killed in a mass shooting in Boulder, Colorado this week. An image of a pale-skinned man being arrested by police led many to conclude that this attack was a product of white supremacy, or an example of what's been dubbed white domestic terrorism. But when the suspect's name was revealed to be Ahmed al alawi Elissa, the accusations of white supremacy faded very quickly. The killing took place barely a week after eight people were shot dead in Atlanta, six of whom were women of Asian descent. The gunmen targeted three massage parlours. A growing wave of anti-Asian hate crimes have also been blamed on white supremacy. But have we been too quick to judge the motivations of these horrific crimes? And can they be so easily slotted into the dominant identitarian narratives? Ella, what have your thoughts been? The fact that so many people, particularly on social media, responded so quickly to the attack in Boulder, Colorado, by saying that this was an example of either, you know, police preferential treatment for white people, you know, talking about the fact that he was calmly taken away and people comparing that to the way in which police dealt with, for example, George Floyd, the people talking about, as you say, Fraser, white supremacy, white privilege, even in the hour in which this was happening, when there was footage of the assailant being taken away, bleeding, was just quite remarkable. And it tells you something about the superficial and shallow way in which discussion about mass violence and gun crime has moved towards. Because the thing that is strikes me as most important in understanding what happened in Colorado, it was actually what the brother of the alleged assailant said, and that he described his brother as being antisocial, mm. having been bullied for being Muslim and being incredibly paranoid, having kind of very serious paranoia about being followed, but also the suggestion was that he had built upon a feeling of hurt and his experience of bullying to then lash out. And the most dangerous thing I think that we have to talk about rather than, you know, calling for laws on gun regulation or for clampdowns on the growth of white supremacy or people holding up placards saying white people have to do something about this is to tackle the issue of violent victim culture, which seems to be prevalent in most of them, the suggestion that the actions of someone like this are justified on the basis of living through a lifetime of bullying for their religious or other beliefs. And so, you know, it's actually quite a complicated picture and it's not solved just by waving around slogans about white people. And when it comes to the shooting Atlanta, I mean, in a similar way, America has a complicated and quite dark history of racism against Asian people. I mean, in particular, racism against Chinese and Japanese people that we saw throughout the 1900s. And so that plays a certain role in, in when attacks like this happen. But the idea that that can be explained away as simply white supremacy 
does a disservice to getting justice for the victims and understanding what really happened here. But it's a kind of lazy way of suggesting that no one is really at fault, that actually it's just this nebulous mm. idea of white privilege or white supremacy that floats above the perpetrator, that it, that it actually isn't linked to the decisions that they made, that it's just this kind of cultural malaise that's affecting them. And it's not only lazy, but it also means that we don't move towards preventing any of these things from happening in the future. I mean, particularly when it comes to the prevalence of these mass shootings, whether it be, you know, Islamist violence, right wing attacks or the spate of mass shootings that have happened in America over the last few years. Talking about them in the superficial level of explaining them away with cultural phenomenons like white supremacy or identity politics doesn't do anything to stop these from happening in the future. You have to be specific about each one of these attacks and what's behind them rather than relying on easy things that you can hashtag and tweet about. Tom? No, the discussion around it has been really revealing and quite grotesque. As Ella was saying, the way in which it unfolded in relation to the Colorado shooting, everyone just assuming that this was a white guy, this is becoming basically an opportunity. Horrendous killing becomes an opportunity to make prepackaged points about white men being the primary domestic terror threat, white people need to get their house in order. And then as soon as his name is released, suddenly it becomes a discussion about gun control. I mean, this is really unedifying, to, to say the least. And there was even a layer of people who were trying to insist that he was white after the fact, because I think in America, technically on the basis of the census, Syrians are classed as white. So again, you just yep. see tumbling down this, people getting the Dulux colour chart out in order to <laughs> back up their predetermined positions on things. The way in which identity politics is kind of infecting everything, I think is really unpleasant. And it's also distorting the discussion of racism, frankly. I mean, the swiftness with which the Atlanta sort of massage parlour shootings were held up as a race hate crime something which could be linked to the pandemic, Trump's rhetoric around Kung flu and the China virus and all the rest of it. Even though the FBI came out pretty quickly and said that they didn't think the motive was racially motivated, this bloke seemed to be some sort of depraved person who said that he was killing these women as a kind of act of self-restraint almost, like because mm. he couldn't help himself, he used sex workers, whatever. You know, we shouldn't believe a word he says, of course, but nevertheless, it seemed like the determination was that it wasn't racially motivated. And yet, one of the Atlanta senators came out and said, well, we all know hate when we see it. Basically, just rejected this out of hand because it didn't fit what had become a convenient narrative, which was to talk about Trump in particular, kind of generating this wave of anti-Asian hate, the idea this was just another tentacle of white supremacy which again doesn't really stack up because Robert Cherry wrote on Spike this week, disproportionately anti-Asian hate crimes are committed by other non-white people. So it just doesn't fit the narrative. And you end up getting into very unpleasant often discussions about who's committing what and where, which seems to me quite unpleasant and unedifying. I think what you see in that, particularly with the Asian American example, who um, particularly in this identitarian nature have a very complicated relationship with woke politics and all the rest of it, is how identity politics is not really about care or concern about minority groups, really. It's about the willingness to use them as a political weapon in certain circumstances. That's not all of it, but that's certainly a large part of it. So if a particular tragedy, or at one point it feels like the lot of Asian Americans can be used to bash Republicans and Trump, then they'll do it. And yet, as we've talked about, I think, on this podcast recently, up until a few weeks ago, there were all these discussions about whether or not Asian people should qualify mm -hmm. as people of colour, there was that school board district in Washington, I think, which started counting Asians in with whites in terms of their academic achievements, because obviously they disproportionately do very well in academic settings. There's been this rumbling controversy about some school board vice president, I think, in San Francisco, who suggested that Asians exploit white supremacy. All of that kind of melts away when they're convenient victims again. But nevertheless, that horrendous status they have within this kind of new woke politics is really, really ugly. So it just shows how important it is that we just dispense with this. It clouds our discussions of, of tragedies, of racism, actually, mm. in terms of where it is happening, who's perpetrating it and what can be done about it. And it gets you into just grotesque point scorings at times of remarkable tragedy. And it just seems like the culture will conquer everything in America at the moment. Yeah, that's right. You know, the discussion around race, I mean, the kind of Asian category is a reminder of just the insanity, the nonsense of race as a viable category of, of human beings. Not least because as, as British people, when someone says Asians, we think of South Asians. When someone says Asians in America, they think of people from the East Asians, people from the Far East. And as you said, you know, the fact that under American immigration law, Syrians are defined as white, whereas, you know, they'd be, if you probably asked anyone, they'd probably say they were people of color, just, you know, from the color of their skin. But for, <laughs> for, from some obscure court case back in the 19th century, you know, Syrians got to become white. I mean, think about in Britain, the way that 
Irish people have gone from being in that same disgusting trifecta of no blacks, no dogs, no Irish, to now having white privilege. So it's a, it's an important reminder that race is a very kind of fluid category, something that we absolutely should not obsess over, whether in a racist way or a, what now seems to be considered an anti-racist way. And, you know, obsessing over racial difference is only going to actually compound racial tensions further. Ella? You end up spending so much time talking about who the perpetrator is, what their identity is, what they look like, and where they come from, at the sacrifice of talking about why they did it, what the motives were, what were the specifics behind the attack. I mean, in particular, I was looking at the outrage against the discussion of the Atlanta attacker. The captain, Jay Baker of Cherokee, the county sheriff's office, said in that press conference, that very controversial thing that upset so many people, talking about the attacker saying he was pretty much fed up and kind of at the end of his rope and yesterday was a really bad day for him and this is what he did. The Guardian said, you know, this is all just another white man that's had a bad day. And this is how people explain away white violence. But actually that trend of explaining away people's actions on the basis of victimization or the kind of mental health aspect of it is prevalent across the board when it comes to attacks. I mean, people said that the reason why the attackers that killed people in the Charlie Hebdo office had done so was because there was an epidemic of racism and Islamophobia against Muslims and that it was sort of understandable in the context of that. The response to the Samuel Paty beheading last year was similarly explained away by the fact that people had upset feelings and that Muslims had taken too much. I mean, the discussion about Shamima Begum, I mean, I know she was technically a child when she left this country, but there's a suggestion that her actions can be explained away on the basis of her being groomed or mentally ill or, you know, all these things. And so you end up never actually getting to the ins and outs of what has actually happened. And most importantly, respecting and defending the idea that the blame of a situation like that lies with the assailant and that, yes, there are circumstances in which things happen, which can make you understand why a person takes such heinous action as to murder people on a mass scale, but that you don't explain them away and actually forgive them on the basis of kind of crass explanations of victimization. So what's the outcome is that you never really get a clear picture or an honest debate about why this is happening. You know, why are mass shootings becoming more prevalent, particularly in America? Why are there terrorist attacks happening? What is the trends behind the scenes here? And instead, we're caught up in a, a really rather infantile and infuriating discussion about the identity of these shooters, which really makes no sense. Spikes is producing more content than ever. And I know you want to keep up with all the fantastic articles, essays, podcasts, and interviews that we're publishing every day. If you never want to miss anything we do, make sure you sign up to our daily newsletter. It's called Today on Spiked. Every weekday, you'll get a roundup of all of Spiked's content, plus some exclusive commentary from the Spiked team, usually Tom Slater or myself. To get all of that, just go to spikes-online.com forward slash newsletters and sign up to Today on Spiked now. Now, back to the Spikes podcast. The EU is still struggling to get to grips with its vaccine crisis. EU leaders veer between demanding harsh export controls on vaccine supplies to denouncing the vaccines as ineffective and dangerous. This week, tensions have been rising between the UK and the EU as the UK's rollout continues to leave the EU trailing. Currently, the UK has given jabs to around 45 in over 100 residents, compared to around 13 per 100 in the EU. To understand what's gone wrong, I caught up with Bruno Waterfield. Brussels correspondent at the Times. Bruno, we're speaking on Thursday. EU leaders are holding talks on how to boost uh, vaccination rates and, and they're mooting potential controls on vaccine exports to the UK. I wondered if you could just fill us in on um, some of the latest goings on and thinking over there. Right. So yesterday, that was Wednesday, um, the European Commission proposed some changes to an existing regulation that was introduced amid great controversy, especially over Northern Ireland, on January the 29th. And they've extended export controls, that is, you have to register 
exports and potential restrictions blocking shipments, an export ban to all countries apart from Africa. And they've introduced new criteria. And those two new criteria are very important. One is something called a reciprocity, which is that they don't want to be exporting vaccines to countries that make vaccines but don't export them uh. back to Europe. We could come back to that a bit later on. It goes down to the root of the bitterness and dispute over AstraZeneca with Britain. And there's another criteria that's new and invented, which is proportionality or equivalence. The EU does not want to be exporting vaccines to countries that have a higher vaccination rate and a better picture in terms of epidemiology. Now, obviously, that puts Britain in the frame uh, as well, because uh. the British vaccination programme, which is pretty successful, though not as successful as Israel's, is some three times ahead of the EU's. And it's that fact, actually, Britain is ahead, Brexit Britain is ahead, that is, is sending people a little bit mad, a little bit deranged. Governments are under a lot of pressure. People are very unhappy with the fact that it's been a very slow vaccine rollout. The EU is about two months behind because of its poor decisions. I mean, imagine if people recollect how bonkers and loony and dingbat deranged people went in Britain after the Brexit <laughs> um, vote, the sort of bedwetting, hysteria mm. and all the rest of it. It was a bit like that about vaccines. This is their sort of like going crazy moment. So the EU, which is apparently a great champion of free trade the, and multilateralism, the, the, the EU that castigated and ranted and raved about Donald Trump is itself gone full Trump. It's proposing possible export bans. The EU makes or, or is the territory where the factories that make around 75% of the world's vaccines are based. Um, um, Britain, in, on, on that sort of scale, doesn't feature at all as a vaccine producer. So the idea that the EU is going to pull up the drawbridge would effectively destroy its own pharmaceutical industry, which is a great success, particularly uh, something like the uh, Pfizer-BioNTech uh, mm. jab, which is probably one of the most successful, although it's also uh, one of the most expensive. So the whole idea of export bans is a bit crazy. Um, a lot of people are going a bit mad in terms of the EU. It's a great distraction from actually doing what they should be doing, mm. which is getting jabs in people's arms. And one of the most shocking elements of this whole saga has been the way that EU leaders have run what feels like almost a smear campaign against the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. I mean, the latest accusation seems to be that they're hiding millions of jabs from Europeans. Could you tell us a bit about that story this week? And also, you know, is there a political side to these kind of accusations, do you think? So, yes, there's a witch hunt against AstraZeneca that entered into contracts with the British government, quite stringent contracts on it being not for profit, uh, quite stringent contracts on it developing regional production supply chains so that countries in Asia, particularly India, for example, wouldn't be too dependent on these big factories in Germany and Belgium and the Netherlands. And this was all happening this time last year. I mean, really, mm. you know, quick off the ball with this. So it is an Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. It's actually a slightly unusual project. And Britain, of course, authorised the AstraZeneca vaccine quite quickly. It did it in a rush. And there was criticism about, actually good criticism, about the data quality of the data that mm. AstraZeneca presented. They were doing it in a hurry because, hang on, we should be in a hurry because people are dying. This pandemic is destroying our societies. Certainly the lockdown measures are destroying societies. So it was important to do it in a rush. And it has to be said, since then, the AstraZeneca production has not been a huge success. It is also the case that Britain's contract comes first. It's the usual way with uh, contracts. Again, you know, very unsurprising to almost everybody, that seems totally rational. Now, the Commission has become obsessed as a substitute, as a compensation for the fact that it messed up its own vaccine procurement. The Commission has become obsessed with blaming AstraZeneca, blaming the government for the EU's own problems, and has engaged in this sort of what looks like a wild goose chase to find the hidden jabs that AstraZeneca are hiding from the European Commission. So uh, AstraZeneca, hand in hand with the evil Boris Johnson, one assumes, is engaged in some kind of supply conspiracy against the European Union. This led the um, Italian Cabaneri to, to raid a, a bottling plant just outside Rome yesterday, where they found 29 million AstraZeneca jabs. This was very excitedly briefed out by one assumes commission officials to French and Italian journalists, the two countries the most uh, keen on export bans as proof of perfidious Albion, perfidious AstraZeneca. It all went 
very, very badly wrong, very, very embarrassing for the commissioner who d- launched the raids, a guy called Thierry Breton. And they found these jabs, and this seemed to be the proof. But then, of course, it turned out that the jabs weren't even made in Europe, or 13 million of them were made in Europe, they were made in India. A lot of them were due to go off to poorer countries, and the others were actually destined for the EU. So extremely embarrassing. The commission is obsessed that there's a conspiracy and is determined to find one, but it hasn't so far. Then you get into the whole safety question. That began right at the beginning. As soon as the UK authorised AstraZeneca about a month earlier than the EU, so the European Medicines Agency has a deserved reputation it casts along such shadow as it should. And the EMA said, AstraZeneca is fine. It's fine for all adults. You then had a procession of countries led by Germany and France who said, well, we're not going to give it to over 65s. There was no evidence to suggest at all, not in the slightest, that it wasn't efficacious. It was using it on for old people um, wouldn't work. But a whole procession of countries, most EU countries, then put an age limit on it, which meant actually that right at the beginning of their vaccination campaign, millions and millions of Europeans, tens and tens of millions of Europeans who are in the most vulnerable age range for COVID-19 didn't get the vaccines. And that certainly would have led to loss of life. We then had a situation a couple of weeks ago where there were some cases of um, very rare cerebral blood clotting, not completely unknown in the world of pharma with vaccinations and immune reactions and all the rest of it, and very, 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 very rare. So globally, at that time, over 20 million AstraZeneca jabs had been administered, and there were just 25 cases. But in Germany, there were seven among under 55s, mainly women, and three people died. Now, the Germans decided to suspend use of the vaccine. The French and Italians then had to follow suit, as did other countries like the Netherlands, too. So AstraZeneca vaccine stopped being used altogether. Belgium, Mm. now this is really important though, because it shows the political character of these decisions. One, the EMA said that the vaccine was still perfectly safe to use, the more objective body. So the Germans and French were going against their own regulator. And the other fascinating uh, aspect is that the Belgians said, no, we're not stopping. It is more important to get the jabs in people's arms. There are people crying out for these vaccines and we need to jab them. That is the big risk to stop doing that. So they, the Belgians highlighted that risk aversion, the precautionary principle, Mm. being cautious, was actually a process where the EU or EU countries, significant EU countries such as Germany, were actually averse to the wrong risks. And that has cost a lot of lives. It's also extremely difficult to untangle those regulatory safety decisions by national regulators from the AstraZeneca battles, the battles over supply. So when the decisions were taken on age, on January the 29th, the same day as the EU went for export bans, it's very difficult to untangle those decisions because, you know, national regulators are certainly a bit tangled up with the pharmaceutical industry. When AstraZeneca was suspended two weeks ago, there was also a vaccine war raging at that time. So I think it is possible looking at it. And I think you know, a lot of people have been very unsettled and worried about the way in which the European Union has reacted to the AstraZeneca vaccine, which, as I hinted earlier on, because of the Oxford element, the not-for-profit, the focus on regional supply chains is actually a bit of a disruptor in a very centralised European-based pharma industry too. And I think when the history books are written, it will be seen as a particularly shabby chapter in the EU's history, and it has a few of those chapters. And finally, you mentioned the kind of risk aversion. I just wanted to get your view on whether you think, you know, obviously there has been a series of mistakes made in this crisis in relation to the vaccines. Does that speak to something, a deeper problem with the EU's kind of governing philosophy, the way that it's set up? I mean, what's the, is there a deeper background to all of this? Yeah, I think it is. I think it really, really is. I mean, the problem is it it, it speaks to a profound malaise in, in European political culture. I mean, what were the governments of premier world states, Germany and France, thinking by outsourcing such decisions and outsourcing the commissioning of medicines that are absolutely vital Mm. to the survival of your people? Imagine outsourcing that to a bunch of middle-ranking lawyers in Brussels. There's also the risk aversion that we spoke about just now, but more profoundly, 
there is this desire to make decisions technocratic, this desire to hide behind institutions. It was very interesting when the German health minister was talking about their decision to suspend AstraZeneca. He kept talking about public confidence Mm. in the vaccine and also, most importantly, in the medical authorities. Now, of course, what they were actually doing was undermining trust in the vaccine in the name of shoring up their own authority. And this is the problem with the precautionary principle is it departs from science and it actually becomes about reassuring people. Mm. It becomes about panning out comfort blankets rather than vaccines. And obviously that was a really big mistake. But much, much more profoundly, it goes down to this idea of what politics really is. And the EU has an idea of politics as technocratic, legal, regulatory decisions, and certainly not a contest between good and bad ideas. Now, the contest erupts sometimes. So you can see the contest uh, between the Belgian and German medical regulators when AstraZeneca was suspended. And you can see the rightness of Belgium Mm. and the wrongness of Germany. Now, the EU would like to stamp out that kind of contest because if that contest isn't visible or, or is not there, it's very difficult for us, the members of the public, to judge the people who rule us in that way. And I think it's also shown how hostile to the point of quite aggressive behavior The EU is when it is faced with a contest between a big near neighbour, an independent country, and Britain. So the contrast between Britain's vaccine success and the EU's vaccine failure has driven people a bit mad because it is a contest of two countries or a power block and Britain. It isn't to, in many ways, a contest um, of ideas and they are losing it. And instead of getting better, Instead of winning in a race, well, actually, it's a good race. What a great race to have a mm. vaccine race, get jabs in people's arms. It's wonderful. It's much better than wars and export bans. But, but rather engage in that contest, rather engage in that race. The EU just wants to kill it. It wants to kill it. It just wants to use the world of legal regulation of force, actually, with export bans to stop Britain winning that contest. It shows you that the the EU really hates the idea of politics as being a contest between good and bad, better or worse. Now, hopefully, the EU might learn lessons from that. But, you know, looking back at since financial crisis, the Eurozone crisis, the migration crisis, Brexit, and now this, we know that the EU doesn't learn lessons and that the EU is primarily and fundamentally an organisation that is determined to snuff out the idea of politics as a contest and a race between ideas. Thank you for listening to the Spiked podcast. We'll be back next week, but in the meantime, make sure you keep up with all the latest from Spiked by signing up to our daily newsletter today on Spiked. Just go to spiked-online.com slash newsletters to sign up now.